we um, a few uh, weeks ago, we were on, we were actually on holiday, and I got a call from my neighbour, and uh, uh, my neighbour said um, he was very apologetic. He said, "I'm really sorry, but your, the walls blown down." And, um, and uh, I said, "Really?" He said, "Yeah, the, the, the wall. Has the, the storms just come through London. We were we were in London, and and the wall has literally blown down." And and so I got back from holiday, and, and um, sure enough, the wall had blown down. And uh, what, what was the sort of slightly the freak of nature really is that the rickety rock fence that's in great need of renewal um, hadn't blown down. But the, the wall had uh, blown down. We, we went, we meet um, uh, as, as sort of church staff team, so, so we, um, we meet annually just with all the, the churches in our little network. We met uh, um, uh, last week and, and we had a time of, of prayer and particularly Anna Maria is on our, on our team just felt that that, that that event of the world the, the wall being blown down was that sometimes events happen that are, that are prophetic they, they're, they're meant to show us something they, um, and we've sensed as a uh, as we pray as we listen to God that actually that was the the, the walls of the church coming down in a, in a good way but opening us to the mission and calling that's on us for people who are outside the walls of, of the church. And, that's, um, and as I've been praying that through, that, that little uh, text from Isaiah 61, which actually we used to encounter our prayer night to pray for Ukraine about the captives being set free, about the uh, about healing, about, and, and, and it just says a little uh, verse, verse 4 says that they will build, rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places that are devastated. And, and that's the, you know, that's the, the place of the gospel to do that. That's what happens to us inside out. And, and I want to look at, look at this through, through the window of Colossians um, 3. It's, it's a sort of two-parter. If you weren't here uh, last week, um, I did the first eight, week, eight, eight verses last week. You might go, you, thank goodness for that. Golly, that was fancy stuff. You know. But if, if you don't get the first eight verses, you won't get, you won't get the, the next bit. So they go together. So that's why, that's why Valerie um, re, uh, read them for me. And um, got some notes. Um, got the text there to check I'm not making it up and um, uh, I've got four things firstly put on, put on the new secondly Christ is everything thirdly clothe yourselves and finally put on love put on start put on a, a new nature that's what we're talking put on your new nature it doesn't it doesn't matter what you were or, or right now what you think you are. What, what Jesus Christ thinks of you and about you is, is, is what matters. And when you entrust him, when you trust him, when you believe in Jesus, he comes to live in you and he makes you new. That's, the, that, that's what we learn. And to understand this passage, you've got to, you've got to look back to, to verse 9. Because what we're told is we take off the old self and, and we put on a, a new self. And, that, and that's why those, listen, Paul talks about two things. He talks about sex and anger. Those are the two things he, he grapples with. And, and he says that you leave your old life behind and in fact your old life dies, literally, you, you shed the, the clothes. It's much like a, it's a, to understand what happens when you come to believe, it's a bit like a, a caterpillar going into a cocoon. You, you go in looking one way, sort of crawling along a leaf, <sighs> multicolored. And you go into darkness 
and you get engulfed, but then you get raised to new life as a, as a butterfly. And the, and the word for that changed the word metamorphosis, is the, is the, the word which means transformation. And, and we're just in a, we're in a, you see it in nature, maybe you see it in creation, just that. Um, yesterday, um, a few of us went to, um, went to an Alpha day, um, some teaching on the Holy Spirit in North London, and um, we had a wonderful moment, Valerie and I were sharing, and we were walking along the, the street, and the cherry blossoms, pink cherry blossoms, they're just coming out, and there was a lady walking towards us, on the, we're just coming to the, this church in North London, and, and this lady had pink hair, it was brilliant, and, and um, so Valerie said, would well, you ever stand, isn't that fantastic to see you standing under the pink blossoms, and you're brilliant, and we took a photo, and we just had a real laugh, and she had a laugh, and she was going off to do her shopping, and um, there's just a real sense, I think, of the, of the Holy Spirit is, is blowing, that's what, that, that, that's the image that, um, uh, the picture that Jesus gave of, of what it means to believe in Him. The blowing of the Holy Spirit over your soul. And, and He said that when that happens, you are born again. And, you know, again, that's one of those phrases you think, well, I, don't, I don't mind being a Christian, but I don't want to be one of those. And actually, the born again isn't, isn't a Tally Channel's idea, it's Jesus' phrase. He said this, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless you are born of water and the Spirit. It then says, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at me, he's saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. And, and believers here are described by Paul as those who've been chosen, are holy, and are loved. You see, the reason the old um, self needs to go and the new self comes is, is it's his longing that each of us would know that we are loved, loved. But also you're chosen. That's, that's a mysterious thing, isn't it? You're ch chosen. So at the, at the beginning of time, he, he spoke your name. He set his love upon you. He put a plan in place. But, but in the same way, we also need to decide. And we need to, as, as Suzanne prayed, we need to repent. We need to turn. But when we do that, it's him who did it, not us. That is a longer sermon, which I'll do another time. But God elects and he sanctifies and he loves. You see, God did something, if he saved you, he did something when he saved you. He created a new person, something began in you. And uh, the things that, but not only in you individually, but began in a people. And that's why this letter is written to a church in, in a place called Colossae. And Epaphras had come and spoken to these people about Jesus. And some of them had believed in him. And, and the things that divide us, the things that separate us, make us different from other people, he, he flips that totally. You see, what, what, what makes us apart is the thing, our jealousies, our distrust of each other, our pride. And he, he, he says, no, you've, you've been made new. It's 
It says, Christ is all and is in all. Paul says, you know, once you were you were Greeks, and if, if you were Greek in in the first century, you were basically you thought you were just a business. You were cleverer than everybody else. You knew more about everything than anybody else. You were Greek. And he says, forget that. You were, but you're not anymore. And if you were Jewish, I mean, you thought, I mean, you thought Greeks were Gentiles anyway, so you thought you were top dog because you had the tradition, you had the history, and God had picked you. Goodness me, you picked us. And then, and then, if you were either Jewish or, or Greek, you, you, you could sort of get together with each other and say, at least we're not a barbarian flip. They are really. I mean, we're not a slave. We're not a barbarian. We're certainly not a Scythian. I mean, flip. They are Scythians. Are they? if there were barbarians, the baddest of the barbarians were the Scythians, and the Scythians. Interesting, because nothing's an accident. The Scythians were based in the, the northern part of the Black Sea, the Caucasus. And some, a bit of geography that's really pretty familiar to us. It wasn't familiar six weeks ago, but it is now. So, so on that landmass of the Ukraine, the Greeks and the Jews looked over there and went, I don't know who's over there, but they're, they're Scythians. But you're, you're not that. That's what he's saying. He said, you're not, you're not Greek. You're not Jewish. You're not a barbarian. You're not a slave. You're, you've been set free. Christ is all. That's at, the, that's at the core of it. The way you used to define yourself. I'm, I'm rich. I'm not poor. Or your ethnicity. I'm Spanish, I'm not Portuguese. No, he says, Christ is born. And everything in your life exists for Christ. Everything. Whether you know it or not, he's saying everything for these Colossian Christians, but everything for your life. The box set you're streaming, the business you work in, the it's all his. Christ is all and is in all. Jesus is our fulfillment. Jesus is our peace. Jesus is our hope. And Jesus is our beginning and our end. But you see, he could have, he could have just stopped the letter then. I mean, Christ at first night could have just stopped. I just, Christ is all and is in all. We'll just stick a banner up there and you can. But he, he, he doesn't finish the letter that Because it, it, it needs it, it needs more than that. He doesn't he tells you what that looks like. So what we we've taken the, the, the old life off, we put the new life on. And and it has a lovely and important phrase, bear with one another. It's a great little phrase, it? Bear with one another. And, and the, the truth is, if, if I really don't have to have anything to do with anyone else, my life gets pretty swimming. But, you know, the alarm clock goes and family life begins. And, you know, party time. Got to get everyone out of the door. We put it, suddenly I have to bear with one another. To bear, and you have to bear with your extended family bear with your friends and then and then and and, and when you're Greeks and Syrians and barbarians and some people are serving us some people, man, there's a lot of bearing with one another that's needed. But that's how you become. That's the plan. The plan is you come together and and you you spend, lead your life under Jesus with each other. And what we put on are, are what's called, he says, our virtues. You put on these virtues. And, 
And there are lots of there are lots of good qualities that are important in life. So efficiency is, is important. Diligence is important. But he, he doesn't he doesn't say be efficient and be diligent. He, because, because the virtues are those that, that we need as we tussle, as we bear with each other. So he says be compassionate. Be, be humble. There isn't a Greek word for humble. Don't think what well, I be be patient. And, and then he says this, he says, forgive. as you have been forgiven. So we're, we're, we're shedding the old stuff, we're putting on the new stuff. A man called Thomas uh, Charles had a, um, preached a sermon a long time ago, and it was called The Expulsive Power of a New Affection which is sort of Victorian for saying that. Um, the only, and this is his little phrase, the only way to dispossess the heart of an older friendship is the expulsive power of a new one. So, so how do we, uh, and, and the best way for me to explain this to you is um, if I want to um, stop you eating Big Macs. If, if, I, if I wanted to stop you, there are two ways I can stop you eating a Big Mac. Okay? The, the first way I stop you eating a Big Mac is I, we could just spend the next hour and a half, I could put Super Size Me, which is a movie. If you want to put off eating a Big Mac, just watch Super Size Me. It's a guy who tries to eat McDonald's for a month. It does not go well. And his health is not good at the end of his school. So that, that is one way to say that this is just not good for you. Now the other way, actually a, a, a really effective and more effective way, is, is for me to, to put a, a, go up to the ginger pig and buy the most expensive steak I can find and put it on a grill. And, and so this is, this is beef, this is taste. It's taste and see this so much better than that, and that, that's what that's what he's saying. Paul's saying you'll never get there by going. Really, must be compassionate. Really, really must be less angry, less mad at them. He wants to give you a greater love, and the, and the great love that he has shown you is his title. I'm healthy and raised to life for you. And he says, come be with me now. And I've forgiven all of those things. About, um, there's a theologian called Walter Wink, and about 10 years after, he tells this story of uh, an account of, about 10 years after World War II, uh, two um, peacemakers went to Poland and they, um, they went to meet Polish uh, Christians, to gather a group of Polish Christians. And they said, we've come, we, we want, we've come on behalf of some, some West German Christians. And they've asked us to come because they want to ask your forgiveness for, for, for what they did to you. And, and Christians in that Polish uh, gathering. What, what, one man, uh, he he said this. this funny, he said, um, he said, what you are asking is impossible. Each stone of Warsaw is soaked in Polish blood. We cannot forgive. But before the, the, the group parted, what they did was they did what we did this morning. Let us see the Lord's Prayer. 
And they got to that little phrase where it says, forgive us our sins as we forgive. And there was just palpable tension in the room. And the man, the Polish man who had spoken so vehemently, he said this. He said this to the peacemakers. He said, I must say yes to you. I could no longer pray the Our Father. I could no longer call myself a Christian if I refused to forgive. Humanly speaking, I cannot do it. But God will give us strength. And, and 18 months later, those two groups met in Vienna and, and those friendships and connections are sustained to, today. And it's after the event, after the war, that the reconciling and the you know, we are in the midst of it. And that gave me hope, but also a tremendous reminder of the place that we're in at the moment. Paul Tillich says um, he defined forgiveness as remembering the past in order that might be forgotten. And uh, final thought is, is to put on love, to put on love, clothe ourselves in love, which is perfect unity. I said yesterday we went to a, we went to a little Alpha Day, we were on the course of Alpha. I'm going to be speaking more, more about after Easter. We we'll speak about after a lot after Easter. Anyway, just say. So um, uh, and we went to my friend's church. And my friend has been in, in the church. The church that he is the vicar of was literally close. So it, it was it was locked and it was an ancient ruin. It was locked up. And um, one of, we, we had our little small group discussion about, about what it means to be full of the Holy Spirit. And, and a, a guy who wasn't meant to be in our group, Rachel had chatted, my wife Rachel had chatted to him in the coffee time before, and he just came and joined our group because he just fancied it. And, um, and uh, we were having a discussion about um, being filled with the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And there are lots of gifts. There are gifts of prophecy, and gifts of tongues, and he wasn't at all sure about anything. Really. He sort of, but once, once um, Rachel had shared her testimony of being filled with the Holy Spirit, of giving her life uh, to, to Jesus, it wasn't... He, he, he said, you know, I, I think I might, I might want to live that. It doesn't sound so bad. And what was amazing about this, um, he was a big man, he was a scaffolder. And what was amazing about his story is he said, you know what, I used to, uh, I used to come, I used to break into this church as a kid. And, and when I was a teenager, we, we used to have raids in this church. You, you needed to see what this church looked like. We had stuff hanging from the ceilings, there was graffiti, there were lights, we used to just, I mean, we, we part in here. And 20 years later, the same man sitting in our funny little group who's gone to Kentish Town, Rachel shared that you can be clothed in the love and power of Jesus. And he gives good gifts to his children. And we were able to lay hands on this man and ask Jesus to come and visit him. And what, what happens, as has already happened to him, in fact, what's happened to him is what happened to the church, picture of the church. The, the room has now, from the inside out, there's life and hope and prayer and joy and things. And we have that difference, that's the gospel. And so why don't we understand I'm going to, um, and I just think really encourage.